Father, thank you that you are a God who speaks. Thank you that we have your word, the Bible, the most precious thing this world affords. Thank you that you are here now by your spirit. And we pray you'd speak to our hearts. Speak to us the words we most need to hear. And bring us life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have to confess, the book of Acts is my favourite book in the Bible. It is so full of action. And some of the things that happen in that book are just the most extraordinary, life-changing things that have ever happened anywhere on the face of the earth. I think if you're bored of reading the book of Acts, you really are bored of life, because there is more life than you can possibly imagine contained in these stories. What is the source of that life? Well, of course, is the life that burst out of the grave on Easter Day. That's where the story of Acts starts. It's straight after the resurrection. Jesus has come back to life, and his life bursts into his disciples, and then it spreads out from them through the whole of the known world. It starts in Jerusalem, and then it goes to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And by the end of Acts, it's reached Rome, kind of the center of the empire. There's so much energy about Acts. One of my friends once told me, I think the Holy Spirit is like an 18-year-old man jumping around the church going, I'm building stuff. I'm building people. I'm changing people's lives. Now I ask you, is that the first picture that comes to mind when someone says Church of England to you? (laughs) No, but this is what the church started off like. And although it's possible to be a little bit kind of rose-tinted specks about it, this is where we get our blueprint of what life, Jesus' life, really looks like when it encounters human beings. And Philip is a great example of someone who carries that life and makes monumental changes because of it. So this encounter um, with the, the guy from Ethiopia, one of the first Africans, perhaps the first black person to become a Christian, And the Ethiopian church, as you might know, is one of the oldest churches in the world. And this encounter, I mean, we we don't know for sure, but it is possible that this encounter started off, sparked the spread of Christianity across the whole continent of Africa. And if you think about the African church, the size, the vibrancy, the life that's in the African church even today, you think, wow, one conversation by the side of the road, and look what happened. That's the kind of spirit of the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit does something that just mushrooms into more life than we could ever possibly imagine. Now, I wonder, have you ever had one of those moments where you have this little prompting that you think, oh, I should do that, and then you do it, and something amazing happens as a result? Does that ever happen to you? Just kind of occasionally. Good, a few of us. Has anyone got an exciting one they want to share with, share with the class this morning? No? Okay, we'll pray for more courage for next week. Um, I, d- I know, just, just a very small scale example of this. Um, as you might know, this church is part of a team of four churches in Marlow Bottom, Little Marlow and Bism. So this morning I've done a service in Little Marlow, a service in Bism, and now I'm here. And one morning I arrived on, on this um, kind of round that I sometimes do on Sunday mornings at Bism Church. It was snowing, it was 8 a.m., and there were about six of us there. Okay? And um, one of the ladies um, who... Um, is probably 80 and quite frail, was there. And I went, wow, Pearl, it's great to see you. I wasn't expecting you'd be here today. And she said, well, I wasn't expected to be here either. But um, I just thought, I'll open the door and see if it really is as icy as there as it looks. And as I opened the door, my friend Rowena drove past and stopped and gave me a lift. And so I could come to church. Isn't that a wonderful answer to my prayers? And I went, wow, that is, that's amazing. And Rowena was standing next to me and she went, yes, yes. The most, the most amazing bit is, I don't ever drive past Pearl's house on the way to church. But as I left home this morning, I just felt I should drive through the village rather than going through, you know, the town. And so uh, I don't really know why, but I did. And just as I was driving past Pearl's house, the door opened and there she was and I came to church. Now, does that kind of thing ring any bells? I mean, I would say that that was an example of the spirit prompting Rowena to go a different way and pick up Pearl. Did it change the whole history of the human race? Probably not. But was it a really lovely example 
of how when we pay attention to God, sometimes really good things happen that make our days far better than if we're close to them. Well, Philip was having a day a bit like this, because there he was, minding his own business, and he got a prompting to go down towards the coast on a road that was wild, was through the wilderness. One translation possibly means that it was noon, which is like the worst time of day in the Middle East um, for traveling. So you might notice if you've got the Bible open that the, the word travel south um, down from Jerusalem to Gaza could also mean travel at noon. Um, and so he got up and went. Now that's the key to the whole story right there, isn't it? He got up and went. Because if he'd ignored that prompting, there wouldn't be an Acts chapter 8 or the second part of it. But he did. So he got up and went. And then he bumped into someone on the road who was a very interesting man. Because this guy, as I've, I explained earlier, is from Ethiopia. It's actually modern-day Sudan. And he was from, um, from the Queen's Court, the Candace. Um, the inscriptions they discovered in, in Sudan um, indicate that that was kind of the title that was given to the, kit, to the Queen. Um, and he is like her Chancellor of the Exchequer. He's in charge of the Treasury. He's an important, influential, wealthy man. Um, and he is traveling to Jerusalem to worship, and he's come back again. Now, when I first read this story, I remember thinking, the guy's in a chariot. I'm thinking kind of gladiator. You know, he's probably moving at 40 miles an hour. Wow, Philip was like the Usain Bolt of the ancient world. How did he keep up with him? Well, I've discovered that chariots, usually in those days, were pulled by oxen. So he's probably not moving quite so fast. So if, in case any of you like me are going, how did he catch up with the chariot? I mean, he's plodding along. Imagine going from Sudan to Jerusalem by ox. Man, that guy wanted to worship, didn't he? That's a long, long journey. And Philip kind of draws up alongside him. And another interesting thing is that this guy from Ethiopia, he was a eunuch, which means that he is not permitted to um, be part of the Jewish people. He, according to the laws, the Old Testament laws, he would not be allowed to convert to Judaism. And so he was going to worship, but he was an outsider. He was an outsider. He was someone, if you like, who would know rejection by the church, and I know that some of you know how that feels. He was rejected by the church, but he was still determined to worship. And so he goes to Jerusalem, he worships, and then he comes back, and um, Philip jogs along and asks him a question. And this is the question that sparked, possibly, the birth of the whole Christian church in Africa. Do you understand what you're reading? And you know, to be involved in God's plans, we don't have to have kind of hugely impressive speeches to make. He sees him reading the Bible, reading the Old Testament scriptures, and says, do you understand what you're reading? And so the Holy Spirit has taken Philip and his obedience to these promptings down onto the road alongside the chariot, and then he asks that one question, and the man replies, "Um, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? So he says, why don't you come and sit with me in a bit and we'll travel at one and a half miles an hour for, um, for half an hour and have a chat. And he was reading a passage, which is from Isaiah 53. If you've got a Bible, if you've got one of the church Bibles on page 710, it's a very famous part of the Old Testament, actually. And um, I just want to ask you, if, someone, if you bumped into someone who really wanted to know about God and they were reading Isaiah 53 and they said, could you explain what this means to me? How many of you go, oh yes, I could. You know, part of being useful to God, I would say part of being led by the Spirit, is actually knowing the story, knowing the scriptures, reading them. So at least you could say, do you know, I've read that a few times and I don't understand it either. Should we, should we have a talk about it and see if we can work that out? But it's a prerequisite of Philip's effectiveness as an evangelist that he knows the Bible, that he's reading it. And of course, in the Jewish tradition... Uh, many young boys would have memorized um, the whole of the Torah, which is um, that much of the Bible. They would memorize that by heart by about the age of 10. And the ones who were, who were really good at that would get to me- uh, memorize the prophets as well, which is up to about, I'm just going to roughly, about that much. And then the really best of the best would memorize the whole thing by heart as children. Puts us to shame a little bit, doesn't it? So... Philip, with his knowledge of the scriptures, is able to explain this passage, Isaiah 53. And if you don't know it, and of course, 
you know, no one is born knowing it. It's only by kind of reading that that we know it. And what I've discovered reading it is that this passage in Isaiah from about ch- uh, chapters 49 to 53 describes someone. It's a portrait of a person. And this person is called the suffering servant. It's called the suffering servant passages in Isaiah. And, and Isaiah is prophesying, he's predicting like, through the same Holy Spirit that one day God will send someone as a servant who suffers for God's people and brings them peace and healing and freedom. And it was a massive kind of a point of discussion amongst the rabbis. You know, who is the suffering servant? And it became equated with this person they called the Messiah, who was going to be the chosen one who God would send. And so there are passages in Isaiah 53, um, like the one that I read here. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, but he was silent and didn't open his mouth. And in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. But who can number his descendants? His life was taken away. And in other places, in those passages, it says the punishment that was upon him has brought us peace. Now, who was he talking about? Well, Philip, sitting in the chariot with the Ethiopian, started with that scripture and explained to him the good news about Jesus. So you can imagine the conversation. Who's he talking about? Is he himself or someone else? Well, actually, he's describing a person. You've read that passage, and it's this person who who, uh, is led away to the slaughter, who gives up his life, who, um, who who is silent before all of this humiliation, who's deprived of justice, and who has punishment that actually brings peace to other people. But I know who this person is. His name is Jesus. And he lived and then was crucified, deprived of justice, went silently to a death that God used to soak up all the punishment that the human race deserves and give us peace. God himself has revealed himself through his Messiah Jesus, promised centuries ago. And Philip would say, I'm a witness that you really can find peace through this man, Jesus Christ. It's astonishing, isn't it, that God himself would take all this upon himself for us. And the Ethiopian man gets it. He gets this message. Now, many of us, and this is true of me a lot of the time, we go, yeah, yeah, I know that, I know that. But actually, anyone who says that doesn't really know it, do they? Because the message that God himself would enter this world to suffer and to die for us, to spare us that punishment and death, that is the most extraordinary news. And we know that the Ethiopian eunuch gets it because they go past some water and he goes, look, here's some water. Is there anything to stop me getting baptized right now? This man who's been, who's been rejected and alienated from God's people all his life is suddenly told, no, you can be in because of this suffering servant. And he jumps at it. I mean, imagine that. You're kind of wandering in, into church or around the churchyard and someone comes up and then you start talking about the scriptures and you tell them that God loves you. He wants you to be on the inside, not on the outside. You're all of this stuff. You can find peace from it all. And they go, yes fantastic. Oh, here's a river. Is there anything to stop me jumping in now and being baptised? And so Philip does what I'm sure you do. And he says, no, let's jump in together. And he baptises him there and then. Would you love that? I actually would. That's the kind of adventure that we get to enjoy when we enter God's kingdom and we're led by the Spirit. And so Philip, who woke up in bed thinking, wow, I wonder what's going to happen today, ends up you know, he's, he's walked into the desert, he's had a conversation with this guy, you know, who's like a celebrity from his own country. They've talked about the scriptures for a bit. They get to a, a, a pond or a river. They jump in it together. Do you think at any moment Philip's like, whoa, this is crazy. I love this, I love this life. 
And then the eunuch is, is he's baptized, and, spirit, and, and, and Philip mysteriously is kind of spirited away where God has some more people for him to talk to in Azotus, which is um, a little bit further up towards the coast, and then to Caesarea, which was like the Roman headquarters. So um, Philip is on, you know, he, well, I've changed Africa before breakfast, and then I'm going to head off, you know, a bit further, because I'm sorry, I can't stay and chat. I've got some other stuff that God's got for me to do. What a lifestyle. Do you see why I love the book of Acts? You know, the book of Acts is not for people who like to stay in bed till lunchtime and then kind of watch TV all afternoon. It's, about, it's for people who want to change the world, who want to get involved, who want to wake up and go, God, what have you got in store for me today? Who can I meet? Who can I talk to? And God will be like, mm, might be a bit disruptive to your schedule. And Philip's like, okay, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it anyway. And some of us, and me, too much of the time, are like, mm, I've got some stuff I really, other stuff I need to do today. Because this, I mean, this story speaks... Uh, maybe speaking to you if you identify with the Ethiopian. Maybe you've been really hurt or rejected by church. Maybe um, you've been kind of wandering around trying to find God. Maybe you go and worship week after week after week, but you haven't ever really properly answered the question why. What's at the very heart of this? And maybe like him, you need to hear that the very heart of it is the death of Jesus Christ for you, because God loves you that much. And if that's you, the answer, the response, is to just jump in the river, metaphorically. You could do it literally if you want, but don't say, I told you. Jump in. You know, the happiest Christians are the ones who go, right, all my eggs, God, in your basket. The most unhappy Christians I meet are the ones who are like, oh, I'm trying to ride two horses and it's absolutely tearing me apart. So if you're like the Ethiopian, give give in. Give it all over to God. What have you got to lose? This is one of my favorite sayings of an American missionary who who lost his life um, telling people about God. He said, you are no fool if you give up what you cannot keep to gain what you cannot lose. A wholehearted response to God is the key to a free and happy and joyful and meaningful life. Or maybe you relate more to Philip. You know, the, 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 the build-up to this is that Philip, he is having a bad time. Because if you know the story, the church explodes into life and then it starts to get in trouble with the ruling authorities, which always happens when the church um, explodes into life. Pray that I will get in trouble with the bishop and the archdeacon. That's a good sign in many ways. Much as I love the bishop and archdeacon, I think if they were here, they'd go, yes. I want you to be coming and saying, oh, this probably shouldn't be happening. But, but it's worse than that for Philip because um, many of the early disciples have been stoned. They've been killed, executed, and the church is scattered. I mean, Philip is having a bad time. If anyone has an excuse to stay under the duvet till lunchtime, It's Philip. But I bet you he's still reading the scriptures every day. I bet you, well, we know, don't we? He's open to the promptings of the Spirit. And God speaks to us in so many different ways. But in my experience, the more I read the Bible, the more God speaks to me in all kinds of different ways, including especially what I'm reading. And maybe that speaks to you that even in the hardest times, it is possible for us to wake up in the morning and go, I am following God today. Whatever else happens, I'm going to do that. And every day, till I stop breathing. I'm going to read the Bible, however inconvenient or hard it is. I'm going to try and obey those promptings in my life, the things that I know God wants me to do, however inconvenient or difficult they might be. And perhaps most of all, the challenge of Philip's life is, I'm going to live for others. I'm not going to try and build up some big reputation for myself. God wants me to go into the wilderness, I'll go. He wants me to go to where the horrible Roman soldiers are at Caesarea, where I'll probably get stoned, I'll go. If he's got even one person being pulled along by an ox in a chariot who I need to speak to, I'll go. Because my life is available to God. 
That's the challenge. And the book of Acts, as I said at the beginning, is a picture to us of life led by the Holy Spirit. And I hope the last few minutes have made you think, as it makes me think, oh, my life doesn't look very much like that. But here's the thing. We don't get to write a different book of Acts where life is exactly like it already is for us. We're meant to feel that tension and we're meant to be challenged to think, well, am I going to live more like this or the way that I'm living at the moment because, well, whatever because, lots of good reasons. And that the challenge that we face as Christians is, are we going to rise to the, the invitation to live this way? To be radically responsive to the Holy Spirit. To be deeply committed. It's a lifelong um, task to become well acquainted with this book. It's not something we can get done in a month or a year or I would say even a decade. It takes a lifetime of long obedience in the same direction. Are we going to decide it's more important for us to see God's word of life spread around the world than it is for us to achieve our own goals for career or family or fitness or whatever else, else it is? These are the questions we have to respond to. This is a picture of what life could be like for each and every one of us if we will respond. But there's only one person who gets to choose. And that's us, ourselves. You are the only person who can decide what your life's going to look like. And my encouragement, my challenge to each of us is to take this on board. And it can't all change in a day. But we can decide today, I'm going to live more like this today than I did yesterday. And it's those daily choices that end up deciding who we are, what our life looks like, who we become, and ultimately, for the whole of eternity, whether we were involved in something like the spread of Christianity across a whole continent, or whether we gave our lives to some lesser goal. We are involved, unless we choose not to be, in the most significant movement that the world has ever known or will ever know, with the power to improve the lives of every man, woman and child on the planet. And some people are going to say, I'm in, I'm jumping in the river. And others are going to go, mm, no. Which one am I going to do? Which are you going to do? God gives you the choice. I'm going to leave a, a few, uh, a minute or two of silence now. And I would like you to find a cross somewhere in the church. I'm sure you can see one from where you're sitting. The children at Sandergate School reliably inform me there are over 40 crosses on display in this church. I would like you just to gaze at it for two minutes and to ask yourself, what does it mean to me that God loves me so much he sent his son to die? Let's sit and meditate on that thought for a moment.
It is enough, I believe, to want to follow God with everything. God can help us with all the rest. It doesn't mean changing our whole lives in one day. But if you want to follow God with everything, if you want um, to be all in, I'd like to invite you to stand now, and I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Lord Jesus, though you had everything, you became nothing for us. And you were obedient even to death, giving your life on the cross for us. We will never fully grasp what you did. Or how great is the love that took you there. But in our limited way, with our limited understanding, in the smallness that we feel as we stand before such an act of love, we offer ourselves, our souls, our bodies, to you. We pray that this would be a moment in our lives that really brings change. A moment where we give ourselves more than we have done. Where we dare to put all our eggs in your basket. Where we have courage to commit ourselves and to be known as yours. Please send your Holy Spirit. We believe, help our unbelief. Strengthen our faith. Guide us in your ways. And start today. Father, I pray specifically that every person in this church who wants to respond to you would have promptings this week that they can follow, that would bear fruit in the lives of other people. Teach us more about what it means to be led by your Spirit and help us to resolve each day that to respond to you is more important than any other thing we do that day. Save us from distraction and temptation and lead us in your way that leads to everlasting life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.